to the Hebrews, it's a very important day because they celebrate the giving of the law to Moses on the mountain, Mount Sinai. For them, it's a celebration of the law and God used it in His perfect timing to make it a moment for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Okay, Pentecost means 50th, the 50th day uh, in Greek. That's where it gets its name from for us as Christians. And so I explained last week that the, the, this day is the perfect fulfillment of the law because the law was given to Moses, but it can only be lived out, it can only be understood fully through receiving the Holy Spirit, which was then given approximately 1,300 years later. Assumably on the same day. And I say assumably because it's not a given, it's an assumption, but the fact that God is so specific in everything He does, it does. <laughs> so my English today is delicious. Um, <laughs> so God is really specific in what He does, and so to me it's a given, I just take it as a given, that, that it was on the same day, 1,300 years apart. And so we have the perfect fulfillment of the Old Testament law in us through the Holy Spirit, and we have the law of life, the law of the Spirit. So in all of this, in preparing for last week, a lot of my reflections and meditations have been around 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It's just such a beautifully rich um, little piece of, of Scripture given to us by Paul. And I wanted to start on that today. Paul's writing, and he says he's... Just, he's Again, defending his authority as an apostle. Uh, and I'm picking up from that. And he says, Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of the new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So, let me just pick up on this word ministers first. Well, um, Jeanette is laboring to get us our scripture. This word ministers, the most common Greek word for minister in the, the New Testament is the word diakonos. And what's lovely about this word in the Greek, the, the direct meaning of the word diakonos is thoroughly dusty. Okay, one covered in dust. So the, the idea of a diakonos in, in the Greek day was a servant who would wait on tables, would do the will of the master, typically a paid servant, somebody who would be rewarded. It's not the word for a slave, that's doulos. But, but diakonos, uh, to be thoroughly covered in dust. And I just think that's beautiful, because it, it, it carries the picture of one who is getting busy with the work of the Lord and getting dirty doing it. All right? That's the understanding of the word of a diakonos, to be a minister. And so, so the reason we have the word minister is because it comes from the Latin, Minister, which, if I don't speak Latin, but that's, I think, how they pronounce it, minister, which uh, literally means a servant. That's their word for servant in Latin. So the, the Bible was translated, the New Testament was translated from Greek, Queen in Greek, to, to Latin. And so the word diakonos just got translated to minister. And when it was translated to English and to the King James, they just kept the Latin and made it a, a term of office. So they took it from a descriptor, which is a servant, and they made it a position of authority and office uh, and, and used it to say that somebody who ministers the gospel, who is a minister of the gospel with some kind of authority and understanding of authority. So that's entirely just a translation choice. It's not the scripture. So wherever you read in scripture, minister, read the word servant. Okay, it always means servant. Sometimes there's other words like sundulos and so forth. So it's never, the word minister is never a word in scripture in the Greek that's elevated to, to a position of authority. All right, Jesus said, those who wish to be great will be the least. He says that the church is not meant to be filled with great men, but with servants. Okay, but of course the church has made a, a really good effort at filling itself with great men. Because we're human. And we all like kings. Give us the king, O oh Lord, that we don't have to come before you ourselves. Give us ministers that will do the work for us. But anyway, sorry, let's move on. So, we're all meant to be priests of God. We're all meant to be ministers of the new covenant, right? This is not just a person or people who are uh, put into an office. Even the word office, by the way, and 
bear with me as I go on a tangent because this is now going to be, have to be a two part, so I can afford to go on tangents here. But even the word office is not in Scripture. So in, two, in 1 Timothy 3, where, where it, Paul writes and the King James translates it, uh, he who desires the office of an overseer desire, desires a noble task. Everyone knows that Scripture? There's actually no word office in Greek. It's put into the scripture. So one of the errors, one of the issues with the King James version is that when King James authorized this work, is he wanted one very specific outcome, and that is that the authority of the king and the authority of the Anglican priesthood would be enshrined in the scripture. So he wasn't happy with the previous scriptures, the the Tyndale one and, and the Geneva Bible, because they were written from a point of view of the priesthood of all believers. King James didn't like that because he wanted an organized church with organized uh, priests and bishops and whatnot that would, of course, report to him. So he could have authority over the church. So one of, one of the key, if not the key principle of the King James in its, in its translation um, uh, agenda was to, to in, entrench and enforce the, the authority of the, the ministers, the priests. Okay, which is not, of course, Paul's teachings, but that's what the king wanted. So there's a whole lot of stuff you, you won't find in the King James Version. You won't find the word tyrant, for example, because that was very quickly removed, because the king didn't want to be associated with being a tyrant, so that, you won't find the word tyrant. Uh, you'll also find other words coming in there that aren't in, in any way related to scripture, the word bishop, the word minister, the word pastor. Uh, pastor, by the way, is just... Um, Latin for shepherd. So everywhere in the New Testament, the word for shepherd, poimain, is translated as shepherd. But in that one place in Ephesians 4, it's translated pastor because they wanted a title for this job. So they said, let's just use the Latin because we like to do that to create titles. Okay. Anyway, so, so the King James, the, the, the problem with the King James is that it put a whole lot of words into English usage that have to do with reinforcing the authority of, the, of uh, an organizational structure, priesthood. And one of those words as well, by the way, is ordination, to be ordained. The, the Greek word means to appoint. So, so somebody is appointed to a position of authority. They're appointed to an office. Well, I don't even want to use the word office because I'm falling into King James with myself here. King James, King Jamesisms. There's no office. It's a it's a function. It's a it's a it's an authority carried by a function. So a shepherd is a function. An overseer is a function. Okay. An elder is a function. These are these are functions. They're not positions of offices. At least not according to the early church understanding and the Greek understanding in Scripture. But um, so so I'm just giving you some background here because we're dealing with translations. We're dealing with with preset agendas of people from real historic backgrounds, when they translate the word, they want it to carry a, a, some pre-existing agenda, all right? It's never, very rarely is scripture ever translated without having some sort of thing that they're trying to get across, that, that some meaning that they're trying to aim it towards. So hence, that's why it's so important to always try to go back to the Greek. And there are really good resources out there that you don't have to know Greek, read Greek or anything. I don't. But it's, it's all there for you online. If you go and you just literally type in your chapter and put in Strong's and you can use Bible Hub, which is what I do. And it brings up the Greek and the various explanations and where it's used. And that gives you a much richer and more honest understanding of Scripture. Because you get to separate yourself one level away from all the agendas of people translating it into English. Okay. Sorry. Right. Next thing. So that's off this, this word, minister. So who are the ministers of the New Covenant? All that being said, we are the ministers of the New Covenant. That's at least the understanding of the Greek. Okay, you would read this in English and you think, oh, Paul was a minister of the New Covenant, him and whoever he's, he's writing with uh, here in, in the second letter to Corinthians, um, with Titus, Timothy, etc. But it's all of us are ministers, we're all priests of God. Anyway. So, and then to end this, what's really interesting is, well, of course, you read between the lines, we're ministers of a new covenant. The word covenant is an agreement. It's, a, it's like your, your marriage covenant or a will for when you die. Testament, it's this, it's that, that's the word. Um, and he says what's, what's really interesting is he says, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. What letter is he talking about? 
What letter is he talking about? The? Of? Oh boy. Here's a Jewish person writing to, here in Corinth, mostly, mostly non-Jews. It's a mixed church. But he's writing to an audience that includes Jews who've become Christians to a church that is known to have a whole group who are for circumcision of which James is the leader of the church is part of or the leader of according to, to Galatians. So Paul is not writing to an open space. Get what I'm saying? He's not writing to a friendly audience. There's a lot of opposition to him speaking against the law of Moses. And he's not saying here in some nice way, well, the law of Moses, you know, was all right, but there's something better. No, he's saying the law of Moses did what? It killed people. Wow. That's a statement that carries some weight, doesn't it? That's offensive. There's going to be some pushback for that. He's going to get some pushback. But Paul didn't mind a little bit of pushback. That was his thing. So, let's go to verse 7 onwards. We've got the next one. Okay, 7 to 13. That's good. So, now if the ministry of death... Oh, my word, Paul. Boy, oh boy. Is he digging, is he digging a trench or what? Hey? The letter which killed... Now he's talking about the ministry that brought death. Okay, this isn't going to win him any friends. Now, if the ministry of death, which was carved in letters on stone came with such glory, that's the word doxa, it means splendor, majesty, brightness, you get the idea, that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? Okay, let's pause. Very interesting word here that I think is important to understand. Where it says brought to an end, if you read in other translations like the King James and so forth, you'll see the word abolished. If that which was being abolished, or some might say that which was uh, being made void. There's other translations around it. It's the Greek word, okay, which means to nullify. The, the, the word itself, kartagio, is made up of two words. The first half means to, to sort of focus down to something, and the other part of the word means to nullify. Okay, so to focus down and nullify. That's what cartago means. And this word is actually used a lot. It's used a lot by Paul. And to give you the understanding and context with other scriptures, let's just have a look at those very quickly. If you bring up Ephesians 2.13, I'll show you where it's used elsewhere and in what context. I think it's just important to understand this. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Praise Jesus. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that He might create in Himself one new man in place of two, making peace, that He might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, killing the hostility. So have a look at verse 15. It says, He has abolished... The law of commandments. So here in the same translation, this is the ESV, that's the same word. Cartagia. Here it's translated abolished. In 2 Corinthians 3 it's translated brought to an end. Oh boy, but he, so what's the law of commandments? Follow with me here. It's the law of Moses. Okay. Now, people will say, but didn't Jesus say in Matthew 5 that I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Oh, dear. All right, bring that one up. Look at Matthew 5, 17. I got it up. I thought you, I just knew you had asked the question. <laughs> you, oh, you forgot it. That's fine. Matthew 5, 17. Do not think I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So how can he have abolished the law if he came to fulfill the law? Is Paul wrong? Well, hence you need to go to the Greek. Because the word abolish here is not kartagio, it's a very similar word, katalua, which also comes from the same root, but it's to focus down and to let loose, or to destroy, or to, to nullify in a way that 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 makes something not exist. 
Okay, to dissolve is another word for kataluo. So Jesus is saying, he's not using the same word. He's saying, I did not come to destroy. The right translation for this verse is destroy. Like abolish is actually just a really bad choice in the ESV. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the correct word, which I think the, the King James uses, is demolish. I did not come to demolish, to, to make into nothing, to, to dissolve the law. All right? But I came to fulfill it. Paul is using a different word, which is he says that the law has been made void. It has been fulfilled. Thus it is made void. Jesus didn't come to destroy it. He came to fulfill it. And having been fulfilled, it is set aside and brought to an end. But it's not destroyed. It still continues. Jesus said that it will continue, not one dot in the next verse. is that not one dot or anything will, will pass until it has fulfilled its purpose. Does the law still have a purpose? Yes. It's still a schoolmaster for those who haven't or refused to receive Christ. It still functions right now. It's still working. It's still bringing to life sin and death in the Jewish people. Paul says in Timothy, it was given for lawbreakers and rebels. So for all those who refuse to receive the Messiah, it still works. So <clears throat> it's, still, it's still active. But for those of us who have received Christ, it is set Aside. Made void. Okay. So let's have a look again at other places where that word kartagio is used. Let's bring up Romans 6.6 6, just to give you context. So you know I'm not just making up stories. We know that our old self was crucified with him, with Christ, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. What is brought to nothing? The body of sin. Kartagio. All right, let's have a look at 2 Timothy 1.9. Okay, I'll start reading it. It says, The Lord who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of, our own, because of His purpose and grace, which He gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearance of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death. And brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. He abolished death. Cartagio. So, do you understand that this word that Paul uses to talk about the law is also used by him to talk about sin and death? So, death, just as we as Christians say, death has been defeated. Sin has been defeated. Well, if you're going to say that, you have to say the law has been defeated. Because that's how the same context that Paul uses. The same word. The same implication. Jesus came to set us free from sin, the death of man, and the law. Do you understand the gravity of what I'm trying to say here? I'm trying to highlight that the law is ended for those who believe in Christ. If you believe the law continues in any way as a Christian, then you have to believe that sin and death continue. Because it's exactly the same way Paul describes all of these things. Likewise, we won't put it up, but he talks in 1 Corinthians 7 about marriage. And he says, a woman whose marriage has been brought to an end is no longer beholden to her husband, but she is free. It's the same word, kotegia, annulling of a marriage. There was a marriage, it was the Old Testament, and it was brought to an end, fulfilled. And now we have a new one. Isn't that awesome? So, what obligation have you guys got here to the Old Testament? How much? 1%? 100%? <clears throat> you are free. It's not your covenant. It's got nothing to do with you. Seriously, nothing to do with you. You're not married to that thing. You're married to Christ. And through being married to Christ, through having the Holy Spirit, you by nature do the things that that covenant was trying to get people to do. But you're not under that covenant. Can I have an amen? amen. I think that deserves an amen. <laughs> Get a bit Pentecostal. <laughs> the law has ended. It's been brought to an end. It has been abolished. It has been fulfilled. It has been nullified. Hallelujah. Okay. I hope that's, that felt a bit of an echo. But anyway, I'm excited about it. <laughs> I hope you are too. Alright, let's go back to 
2 Corinthians, what, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians uh, 3 verse 11, I think we were. I think verse 9, hey? If the, anyway, let's start from 9. For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation. Oh boy, Paul. Okay, where we at on how he's talking about the law here? The, the letter that brings death, the ministry of, the letter that kills, the ministry that brings death, the ministry of condemnation. Oh my word. Okay, he's really hammering a point here, isn't he? The ministry of condemnation. Thank you, Jesus, I'm not under that. Well, then the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, if this is the case, what once had glory has come to no glory at all because of the glory that has surpassed it. Okay, he says, indeed, this is the case. What had glory is now got no glory because of the glory we have now in Christ. For if what was being brought to an end, that's cartago, in this one chapter, Paul uses that word cartago <coughs> three times to highlight, to underscore, to, to say, pay attention. The law has been brought to an end. Now, clearly, a lot of people didn't listen to him because the church is still hung up on the law. But anyway... The point is, that I'm just showing you what Paul said. <sighs> okay, right, back to the scripture. Let's try, what, verse 11. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, how much more will what is permanent have glory? What is, what is permanent? Salvation Jesus. Yes? In terms of what Paul said in this chapter, though, let's focus into the chapter. <laughs> What he's saying is true. <laughs> what is he talking about here that has permanency? The ministry of righteousness. The ministry of the Spirit. He says the ministry of the Spirit is permanent. How long does it last for? Forever. Now, question. When he spoke about this ministry of the Spirit, which is exceeding in glory, in splendor and majesty and power. Do you think that part of that remained for the church? Or all of that remained for the church? Question. Important question. Paul... What did Paul mean by permanent? In terms of how much of the Spirit's ministry... Is permanent. 100%. I would like to believe that. When Paul wrote about this thing being permanent, the ministry of the Spirit, he understood the ministry of the Spirit to include a whole lot of stuff. The raising of the dead, the working of miracles, prophecy, tongues, the regeneration of the, obviously, the believer and sanctification and all these things. He didn't divide out the ministry of the Spirit here to the church and say, you know what, when the apostles are gone, only the things that, you know, the church feels comfortable with will be permanent. I'm just making a point. Paul's understanding of what was permanent was what he had experienced of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't divide anything here. He's saying everything that I know, I mean, how can it be glorious if it's not including all the stuff that he saw and experienced. Alright, what's glorious about the ministry of the Spirit? It's the raising of the dead in us first, from the dead to life in our own hearts. The, the circumcision of our own hearts, that's pretty glorious. But then it's all the other stuff that we see too. That's pretty glorious. Raising the dead is pretty darn spectacular. Seeing somebody healed of a chronic illness is pretty spectacular. Having somebody prophesy to you is the truth that something that you're going through, and the person says, This is what the Holy Spirit says God wants you to hear. That's pretty spectacular. These are all the things that Paul had in abundance. He said, I wish that all would speak in tongues and prophesy like I do. Right? Paul, to him, this is the glory of this ministry. All everything, all the benefits that it brings. And he said, It is permanent. It does not. It, it, I don't even know how cessationists get to their conclusions. But anyway, the ministry of the Spirit is permanent in its glory. 
Permanent in its glory. Surpassing glory. Goodness me. If Moses came down from a mountain and his face shone so much that he had to wear a veil. And yet that is nothing. It's as if that's nothing compared to what we have in the Holy Spirit. Goodness me, how far are we away from that? I wouldn't mind my face just shining like Moses's. That would be cool. Alison's. Whoa! Hey, imagine Alison had to walk in with a veil because she's so radiant. But even if that was the case, it would be nothing compared to what this ministry of the Spirit is meant to be, as Paul experienced it. And it's permanent for all of us. That's good news to me. I'm like, Amen. Amen. Gosh, I've got to get you guys a little bit more. Southern Baptist. Glory, brother! Amen. Thank you, Alison. <laughs> Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We're not timid. We're not ashamed. We're very bold. Because we see the demonstration of the Spirit. If you truly believe that God can heal, you would be bold and go and pray for the sick because goodness me, it's not fair if you don't. How can you believe God heals and you just let somebody lie there all crook? That's a bit selfish. But you go and pray for them, you can be bold about it because you believe the ministry is permanent. It continues. And it's glorious. Oh Jesus, please, let, just let us see a bit more of your glory. Man, I want to see more of God's glory. Life's so short. Don't you want to see some of God's glory? <sighs> Come on, Jesus. Why do we have to wait for heaven? You didn't say that. <sighs> anyway, verse 13. So not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to the end, right? We shouldn't have a veil on our face. Let's have a, let's, you know what, we're in 20 minutes. We might finish this. Praise Jesus. Let's go to verse 17. He says, oh, what were we on there? Anyway, 14. Okay. So he says, but then, he's talking about the Jews, but their minds were hardened. And for this, to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yet, yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil is over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, to the kurios, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. Okay, there's a Trinitarian scripture for all the people who might have issues. The Lord is the Spirit. The kurios is the pneuma. Remember last week we were speaking about the Holy, how the Holy Spirit is the pneuma, the wind. Okay? So the Lord is the wind, is how it could also be translated. The Lord is the Spirit. So what does that mean? It means the Holy Spirit is God. Alright? That's a pretty solid Trinitarian scripture. If ever anyone says, oh, but how is the Spirit God? Well, there we go. The Lord is the Spirit. I think that's pretty clear. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. freedom. Sorry. Amen. Didn't mean to blow your eardrums. I just get a bit of brave heart in me there when I see that. You know. What did they say? They can take our what? What did, they, what did he write up and down say? They can take our lives, but they'll never, never take our freedom. There we go. That's the scene that I have in mind when I see that. They can lock us in jail, but they'll never take our freedom. They can put us to death, but they'll never take our freedom. For those who are in Christ are truly free. And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of, degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now there where it says, it's half an hour, alright, let's wrap this up. It says, where... Um, we behold the glory of the Lord. Other translations, which are actually more correct, the King James is a much better translation again in this, where it says, beholding as in a mirror, or looking as in a mirror. The word there in Greek literally means a mirror. So why the ESV put that out? I have no idea. It's just a, it's a bad translation. Because the, the, the emphasis here in the ESV is that we are directly beholding the glory of the Lord. Not so? Like when you read that, that's what you would... Understand to say that those who are looking directly to the glory of the Lord. Where actually the Greek is saying those who look in a mirror are beholding the Lord. Okay? 
Why is this important? Because I think, as best I can understand this, it, it seems to be that Paul is using imagery. Like a woman coming with a veil to look at herself in a mirror. She comes to a mirror and unveils her face, but instead of seeing herself, she's seeing the glory of the Lord reflected at her. And as she beholds that image, she is changed into it. Isn't that an interesting picture? I think that's the kind of the picture that probably would have, the Greek would have, reader would have understood. You as the person coming to mirror, you meant to see your own image, but instead you're seeing the image of the Lord in Christ, and in, and in looking at it, you become like it. So instead of it reflecting you, you become the reflected one. Isn't that cool? You actually end up reflecting what's in the mirror. Hey, isn't that a little bit of fun play with words, isn't it? An imagery. And that word transformed, by the way, it's the same word that's used, uh, translated transfiguration, when Jesus was transfigured. It means to be changed from one form to the other. It's, it's the word that we get metamorph, uh, metamorphosis from. It, it's uh, in the, let me get it right, in the Greek, it's metamorphuo. Okay? To be changed from one state to another. So, so Paul is saying that we come to this mirror, we behold the glory of the Lord, and we are metamorphosua, we are changed from one state to another into the same image that we are beholding. And what is that that we are beholding? It's the glory of the Lord, the doxa of the Lord. And as we behold His glory, we become like Him, reflecting that glory in our life and through our life. Isn't that a beautiful image? And this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And so, so we have the Spirit in us, who is holy and, and glorious. And Christ, He, he is, through, we, through the Spirit, we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. So throughout the New Testament, this word doxa, glory, is always associated with the saints. The saints are meant to be glorious. The glorious ones. Why? Because their Master is glorious, and He's full of glory, and we're meant to look like Him. And act like Him. What a sad outcome for the church to not be glorious. To not believe it can be glorious. To not believe it can display God's glory. That it just has to creep along and get to the end and say, Praise Jesus, I made it, and then die. Oh, that's sad. Lord have mercy. How are we reflecting God's glory? How are we bringing glory to Him through reflecting His glory? Unless we can look at this and say, Oh Lord. Show me your glory. Show me your face. Show me who you are. Show me your nature. Show me your goodness and your kindness and your, your power. Let it just, your dunamis. Your dunamis. Yes, that's the word. The power from which we get dynamite. The power of, of God working in me and through me. Guys, don't settle for anything less. Don't believe in a theology that wants you to believe in something less. Believe in what scripture teaches. Not what man teaches. Remember I read from 1 Corinthians last week. It says, don't put your faith in the teachings of man, but put, it into, put your faith into the working of the Spirit. Put your faith in the Spirit. A demonstration of His life in you and through you. Not just men's words. Alright. I got through that. Isn't that amazing? Jesus, we thank You for... Your wonderful, wonderful word, which should, when heard, build in us faith. And so I thank you for this beautiful piece of scripture from Paul. Where he's writing to the church to say, guys, wake up. Wake up. Look in the mirror. The perfect image of Christ that's reflected back to us through the scriptures. And through the Holy Spirit. The glorious image of Christ that we might become like Him and look like Him and radiate Him, His fragrance of life to the world, to those who, who are seeking Him, and that we can be the stench of death to those who are perishing. Oh Lord, that we would smell like You. That's an, it's just a thought. Let us have Your aroma. Let us smell like You. When people, when people come across us, they either smell our fragrance and go, wow, there's something beautiful about this person, or they just want to wretch. Because in them is death and they, they love death. But either way, let us be your fragrance. And let us reflect your glory because your glory is your light. And we are called to be in the light as you are the light. Your light is not a dim light. Your light is not a, just this little thing. It's, it's 
so intense and so radiant and so consuming that when people see it, they must be changed. So let your light shine in us in, in just great brightness and power and transform us into your image. One step by little step. Day after day. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.